Hi everybody and welcome to Professional Beauty and Hairdresser Journal Ireland webinar for this week. You're all very welcome. Um, sun is shining here, I don't know about the rest of you. Um, and this week we are going to be talking to Sheen Sharkey, who is a freelance stylist. Uh, welcome Sheen, and I'm I pronouncing your name right? Yes. Yeah, you do very well, yeah, nice one. <laughs> So yeah, we're going to talk to you today about um, carving out a freelance career, which is, uh, I suppose, something that like not everybody who goes into the industry immediately thinks about. Um, so we will start at the very beginning. Um, right. I know that you have over 20 years experience in the industry. Um, so I wanted to ask you, did you, you know, when you started out, did you sort of, did you have a goal plan of that would be what you wanted to become? Or was it something that just more happened organically? and maybe just talk us through your early days. So first of all, that makes me sound so old, doesn't it? Because no. like, <laughs> over 20 years in the industry, it's like, and I look so youthful. How could I be that old? Uh, but yeah, actually I went to college after school. So I decided to go to art college when I finished school. And so I did that first, but I did always want to be a hairdresser. My auntie was a hairdresser and I always loved it. But just when I was in school, we all did our leaving. We all went to college. So. That's yeah. what I did. And I'm actually glad I did it because third level education was great. I mean, I didn't do particularly well. I don't think the people in GIT think I was great. But, uh, but you know, I got that life for a couple of years. So that was good. And then I did go ahead and start hairdressing in a very small salon. I knew a girl who worked there. So I was like, I'm not so scared if I know someone. So no, I had no agenda. Like I had no life plan. I was a little bit older than your average trainee. So I was 20 when I started, just nearly 21. So, um, no, I didn't really have a plan. I just wanted to give it a go. And I, I really didn't want to fail because I was after dropping out of college. So I was like, I'm good at hair. I will do this properly. I promise. So um, got into it from there, qualified in that salon. And it was great. But then I'd been kind of getting into the hairdressing world. And I had my eye on Tony and Guy. And I just was like, I want to be one of them. Mm -hmm. um, that, so then I started to, like, my head started to be like, I want to be more than just, like, doing a perm in a salon. So I suppose that was probably where I started to be like, this will be my career. This is what I want to do. I'm not failing again. I am good at it. So then I moved to Tony and Guy. And then from then on, it was just brilliant. It was just awful. But you, you obviously, you must be, um, you know, I know you're saying that, like you didn't do very well in college, but like to get into art college, you would have to be of a certain standard. So you're obviously quite arty and creative. Yeah, like I'm definitely arty. My mom is an artist. She's an amazing artist. Um, my, my dad was a musician. My sister is a mu music teacher. So yeah, that's definitely the type of person I am. And I was good at art. Um, I, was, I was average, to be honest. Like that wasn't where my, my artistic flair is obviously much uh, better use in hairdressing. And so I was, I was grand in college. But yeah, I did get in, you know, so that was good. I don't want to be putting myself down too much, but um, no, it wasn't my... Uh, hairdressing is my thing so yeah no it was great to get in but yeah Tony and Guy when, once I moved there I just was like oh this is it like they just have such a good education structure and it's all about like you don't you can just be in a salon and, and be a hairdresser no bother but like there's so much more and the options are there and they're there for everyone like everyone can go and be on the, the art team everyone can be an educator everyone like it's all there for you and all you need to do is just ask and do it so it was an amazing place to train like absolutely wouldn't regret any of the, any of my training I did in Tony and Guy it was absolutely worth it and still stands to me now brilliant Love so you it. you worked in, in in you got the job in Tony and Guy in Dublin was it but then did you go overseas yeah, yeah so I got the job in Tony and Guy in Black Rock um, amazing team like they were just so brilliant like even down to the assistants when I moved there the assistants and Tony and Guy were so inspiring to me. Like they were amazing. Like everybody's treated kind of the same there. So you mightn't have as mm. much experience, but what you do do, you do amazingly well. Like I was like, oh my God, like their braiding was unreal. And they were only first years. Like, so I was so mm. inspired when I get in there. But I also was like er, young and in my early twenties and I wanted to go traveling. I'd always wanted to go traveling. So once I'd done my exam, it's called your bartering and Tony and Guy, um, you have to work for a certain amount of time to kind of pay back your training and then they let you they set you free so I mm -hmm. went off traveling for a year 
Um, but when I was there and I needed to work, I decided I'd try and work in the Tony and Guy over there as well. Because it's all over the world, which is handy. So I had to go to, uh, I had to go for an interview and then you have to show them that you've got the level that you say you've got and you have all your paperwork and all. And so then I worked in Tony and Guy in Sydney as well and that was brilliant. Really good. That was great to be able to actually, I mean, I know that hairdressing is, is one of those great careers as well where you can, um, you can take it anywhere in the world because yeah. ultimately mo most people have hair. <laughs> um, yeah. It was great that you were able to um, go traveling and then pause and work and make money. Um, yeah. And did you did you go did you go off traveling again, or did you stay rooted there for a while? No, I traveled for the first while I was in Australia. I did all up the coast and down the center, and then my final place where I was was Sydney. So I stayed there for three months, and I worked there. And I could have got sponsorship, like they were encouraging me to stay, but I was never going to stay. Like I, I yeah. was too far away from home. But I I was there over Christmas, so I did a nice busy period in. Um, Sydney a few months there and it was brilliant like it was it was so good and um, but yeah Tony and Guy that's the good thing about Tony and Guy the basic training is the same everywhere so like I knew we all kind of have the same lingo and yeah I fit right in over there it was brilliant and it was easy yeah. and yeah it was great um, and you know but then I after that uh, I came home then and I was lucky enough to get a job back in my Tony and Guy that I'd been in before I left that wasn't guaranteed obviously yeah they will definitely try and take you back if they can but luckily, I, I started straight back into my old salon. Okay. So you, you would recommend, you know, sort of getting a, a foot in the door with a salon like Tony and Guy or Tony and Guy itself to kind yeah. of start your career path? 100%. Like 100%. The training is unbelievable. And you just, you just get so much more experience working in a place that has a really good education like that. Like it's so, it'll, and it doesn't leave you. Like I haven't worked in Tony and Guy for 10 years. And I still talk as if I'm a Tony and Guyer because I just feel like yeah. I am. Like they make you so part of it and it's an amazing thing. Yeah, I, I would definitely recommend a really good training. Put a few years in, get really established. And then hairdressing is amazing. You can do what you like then. Yeah. Um, and then so you, so you came back then. What prompted you to make the jump to kind of going out on your own? Did you stay in Tony and Guy back in Dublin for another good while or did you have Yeah, speed? I did. Like I stayed in Tony and Guy in Dublin until 2009. So I started hairdressing in 1999. And then I did a, I did a couple of years in my, the, sm the first salon I worked in. I kind of moved along quickly there because I was older and I was like, why are you all like hiding? We have classes. Let's go and do them quickly. Because yeah. I was like, let's just do it. And they hated me probably. Um, so then I moved to Tony and Guy. I went to Australia in 2003. Four, I think, and then I came back, and then I stayed there until two thousand and nine. Yeah, loved it. Um, and then in two thousand and nine, I actually moved from one Tony and guy to another Tony and guy, and then found out I was pregnant about three weeks later, which I kind of knew. Like I got married the year before. Like I kind of knew it <laughs> might happen, <laughs> but I was like, that'll take ages. Be grand, and then I was there to my new boss. So um, yeah. And um, so I was there for about nine months and then I kind of knew like during that time, I just was thinking to myself, I just don't think I can come back with a baby to this like Tony and Guy and any hairdressing salon is full on. Like the hours are long. We worked kind of shifts because I was in Dundrum Shopping Centre and there's so much more like there's shoot there's shows you want to go to there's training we did at the weekends like it's yeah. like your lifestyle and I loved it at the time. But I just thought, when I have a baby, like, do I want, I don't want to do it anymore. Like, I don't want yeah. to anymore. So I kind of, the whole time I was pregnant, I was thinking, oh God, what am I going to do? Will I come back? Will I not? And then I was like, maybe part time. And But my boss in, in Tony and Guy in Dundrum was just the most fab lady. And she was so good to me. And when I told her I wasn't coming back, she was like, absolutely great. Do what you want to do. You know, you can always come back again, which gave me, I could relax a bit because I kind of thought I could just come back. So in my head, yeah. I was like, go freelance for a year, mind the baby for a year, do a few weddings, and then just head back to Tony and Guy, and it'll all be grand. Yeah. And then, obviously, here I am, and I never went back. <laughs> so you, 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 like, you took that opportunity then to become, you stayed freelance. Yeah, I just stayed freelance. It just picked up. It was brilliant. So yeah. I just started to, I, I was friends with a, a makeup artist who was already established in weddings. 
And she said to me, like, if you want to do it, I'll just give your name out when I'm, you know, and I was like, oh, do. And see, do any of them want me to do their hair? So I got kind of started that way. I set up a website. I advertised on this, you know, the wedding websites, weddings on yeah. the one five day, um, which cost you a bit of money in the beginning, but it was absolutely worth it. And they were great because, you know, and, and when you work in weddings, there's always a pro pro professional photographer there. Yeah. Photos. And if you get their name and drop them an email after the wedding, they'll throw you over the picture. You just tag them when you put it up on your Instagram and they tag you. And then suddenly it all starts to happen. And word of mouth with weddings, 100 percent. It's probably where I get 80 percent of my bookings word of mouth. Yeah. It just started to kick off. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like if I got one of these every week, that'd be brilliant. And then I was like, oh, two a week. And then I was like, three a week. I'm not going back to work. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it was brilliant. Yeah, so we're like in the sort of initial stages, weddings were kind of like your target market, were they? Yeah, I just felt like, well, I was always going to be an upstyler, uh, like stylist. I, I'm not good at color. An Antonian guy, you could choose one or the other. So I dropped color way back. Okay. Haven't done color in years. And so I was a stylist, Antonian guy. So I would have done um, cutting and styling and shoots if they were around, shows, anything like that, and teaching cutting so that was what I did for my last few years in Tony and Guy anyway so um yeah once I went freelance there was no way like I, I kind of dabbled in a bit of color and, and then I was reminded that it wasn't my thing like color is so technical it's a science yeah. it's not the same like the people who do color are unreal at it and I was always like oh fingers crossed the green doesn't happen like I never really knew what I was doing <laughs> so it was always going to be styling and then I just thought weddings would be better with the baby. I didn't kind of want to be going house to house to house. Like I was like, it'd be better if I could yeah. just do one thing. And also at weddings, as I started to get into it, people book their wedding one year or two years in advance. So my diary would be set out for me. I could organize my childcare. Yeah. And that's what it was all about for me. It was all about the fact I didn't want to leave my daughter. I wanted to mind her, but I wanted to work. So yeah. with weddings, it's, it's just so planned out in advance. There's very rarely any changes except for when a pandemic hits. Yeah. <laughs> but apart from the pandemic, weddings don't change. Like they book in a year in advance, you meet them for a trial, blah, blah, blah. Very odd time, doesn't go, it doesn't happen. But mostly your diary's laid out. It's all very easy to organize. So that was perfect for me for the first few years. Bring it. And... Do you think, um, you know, being like one of the, I know you've spoken about the advantages of being freelance, but do you, in, it's one of the things that you, you get to be more creative because I suppose let's to even take the example of weddings. It's, it's a different sort of medium to like being in a salon where somebody's telling you what they want. Whereas like with a wedding, do you get to give a bit of input and get creative and make almost make your own art and then the person yeah. decides if they like it or not. Yeah, like upstyling, the upstyling um, and finishing side of hairdressing is very creative. And that's pretty much all I do now. So yeah, like my general day-to-day -day work is all creative work, which was always my favorite thing. And the thing with weddings, like you have to be a certain type of person to do weddings. I think you can't be too highly strong or precious about your work. Like if someone shows you a picture and that's what they want, well, that's what you have to do. You can't be like, oh, no, I wouldn't. Oh, that's gross. Yeah. And you have to be like, yeah, lovely. But what I have found doing weddings, and especially because of social media, I have my Instagram page. People usually go there, have a look at what I do, and then come to me. So you start to like, you put up pictures of the stuff you do that you love. People see the stuff that you do. They pick you because they like your pay. So you end up sort of like doing, uh, you, you have a style then, and then you end up just doing your style because people pick you because they like what they see. So I find, yeah, it's really creative and it's all along the lines of what I love. I do really soft hair, textured hair, and that's what people book me for now. So now it's become my thing. So yeah, I, I was really in control of what I did and what I create and it's brilliant now. It's kind of like, that's what I do is, is me. It's my style. I don't have to, I don't have to do things I don't like usually. Like, so yeah, it's yeah. really, and that's freelance. I, d I couldn't really do that in a salon. So yeah, that's that good. I think kind of answers my, my question about like when you're freelance, it's like, it's like, it becomes a process where you begin to recognize your own sort of niche talents and then you yeah. kind of specialize in that. And then you become known for your own, yeah. almost your own look. 
yeah totally that's that's a hundred percent the way it's worked out and it's great and it it, do, it it's instagram like instagram is just pictures it's perfect for us like people i know people love hearing a chat and like people often say like when i do a bit more chatty things on instagram they're like oh i love that but really people just want to see the hair that i do and they want to see the pictures and the instagram does that and then obviously you're, you're going to post the pictures of the ones that you think are the nicest so that becomes yeah. your style so yeah, you kind of morph into your your own little style. Um, we actually had I'll just read it out here to you now. Um, before we started, we had a question emailed into us separately from a girl called Cara Cameron, and she said, "I am starting out fresh as a bridal stylist. I have been online training over lockdown, and soon to be having one-to-one -one training with a professional." And she says, it's safe to say I have no client base yet. My question is, what is the best way to get your first clients? And do you have any advice for me starting out? So first of all, I hope her online training is with me. Um, I know I <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so all the training you can do and all the practice you can do. I have dolly heads. You can't see them, but I have, you know, those practice dolly heads. Yeah practice on them set them up somewhere that looks nice and has lovely light and take pictures of your styles and you know get it get an instagram page or a website and and put all the pictures up so people can see what you can do and they can see your style 100 percent. but to get going in the wedding business i do think probably signing up to um one fab day or mrs to be or those wedding websites is absolutely worthwhile because people go there to look and see who's available and they give you a little blurb and a few pictures and once you get going with bridal hairstylists, like it's all word of mouth, but you just need to get started. So I think definitely those websites and pro probably set up your own Instagram if you're that kind of person and just put loads of pictures, do loads of practice, use your dolly head if you don't have real people and just get people. And like tag other, like the freelance world is such a lovely world. I thought when I went freelance, I'd be so lonely because I'd be on my own. But you usually work with a makeup artist and they're all gorgeous. So you ha usually find your pals there. And the freelance hairdressing world, we're so close. Like we have a WhatsApp groups, we have Facebook pages and Instagram groups where we all throw work to each other. So like just mm -hmm. chat to the people who you admire on, on social media, send them a DM, ask them questions. And, you know, also assisting people is a good way to kind of get in there and see how it works. Like I'm rubbish because I don't really bring assistance with me. I, I prefer to work alone. So unless I have a big, very big bridal party, I kind of don't want somebody with me, but you can assist other bridal hairdressers and, and, and those training things that you're going to like, I've met so many other freelancers while at training things and then you get to know them and then you just throw work over to each other. And so it's just getting in there and getting out there with people, but definitely um, advertising on bridal websites will bring you in brides and then it's word of mouth from there. Yeah, actually, I, did, I didn't think of that about um, people using assistance because I guess when there is quite a substantial, say, like the bride has a number of bridesmaids and everybody yeah. wants their hair done, it's like some people do use help. Yeah. yeah, like you do, you can get some, especially with Americans, you can get some huge bridal parties and you couldn't do, you wouldn't be able to do it on your own in the time. Yeah. So, but yeah. some, people lo some people love having an assistant with them, like would love an assistant all the time. So yeah just keep in touch with people and like you can contact people on instagram so easily now just drop them a dm yeah completely different from before and actually just on the topic of, of weddings and somebody even starting out fresh like has i mean okay we have to mention the pandemic has the, that market obviously it has you know it caught it drew you know people had to cancel their weddings or postpone them to next year has do you think the mark that market is going to change drastically or will it sort of will it adapt itself to i hate that expression the new normal but there is a new normal yeah. or is it is it a case that you don't really know yet like i don't i don't know yet and every day i'm in a different mood about it yeah <laughs> so you talked to me yesterday i was actually quite upbeat about it and i was like no like people are cancelling now but all they're doing is moving their date and then if yeah. i'm free i just book them into the new one so i will do it i just won't do it now and i was all very positive and then more of my job sort of got cancelled yesterday and now I'm like, the world has gone mad. We have no work. 
So I'm being all positive about freelancing, but actually in my brain today, I'm like, I think I might just get a job in Centra because <laughs> it'll be there. Uh, so yeah, like there, there usually isn't as many ups and downs in freelancing. Like if, if this wasn't a pandemic, I would have no negative things to say about freelancing, except for that you have to get good on emailing and admin, which I'm not good at. Um, so the business side of it is a whole different ball game, but I just think hire people. Like I just hired an accountant, so that was good. Yeah. But now in the pandemic, like it is, it's worrying. Like, and you know, your everything is your whole business is just sort of dropping. Like every day, another email and it's dropping. But I'm just trying to stay positive, and I do think that it will get back to normal. It's not that people don't want to get married anymore. It's not like COVID nineteen mm. has made people decide that marriage isn't. Like if, if, if it became unpopular to get married and people decided marriage was off the cards, we'd be in trouble. But it's not. Mm. It's just at the moment, people can't do what they want. A lot of people are just having small weddings. And luckily yeah. for us, they still want their hair, their makeup, their dress and their photographer. They might not be able to have their band, their candy cart and their photo booth, which is devastating for those businesses. But for me, I think people will still do the start of the day the same. And that means I still have some work. Yeah, I mean, I suppose anybody who's, you know, wanting to get married is going to want their hair done. It's as yeah. simple as that. Like I did a wedding, I've done a wedding already. And she was only, it was just her and her husband were just having a, a ceremony with their families. But I still went and did her hair. Like she was still wearing, it wasn't her actual wedding dress. She was just wearing a, a white dress, but she wanted her hair done because. Yeah. Like She's. She's still going to take pictures to record the event yeah. anyway. So yeah. Yeah. Like some, and there you know, there are two types of bride, I suppose. You have your bride who just legally wants to be married and that's the main aim, which I suppose is everybody's main aim, but maybe not everybody's main focus. And then you've got the people who are like, I want to be married, but I want everybody there and I want the big affair. So they're not going to do yeah. that now. But the other people will do it now and hopefully will still want their hair done. Okay. And I suppose, yeah, like the you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, it's, it's not even, it's like, it's affected everybody across the board. Now, I know that it's affected some, like, in a business sense, some businesses have been hit harder, but it's like, I think it's just worth saying that, like, nobody has been unaffected by it. So it's exactly. like, it's something that we all need to acknowledge and just try and figure out, you know, what to do yeah. about it, rather than ignore it. Yeah. yeah. And just um, to go back there a little bit to, you know, you mentioned social media. Um, it's obviously a, a big part of what you do. And is this like, has this grown and is it going to continue to grow that whole social media element? Yeah, like I think social media is brilliant for this sort of job. It's free, obviously. So yeah. you, can, you, can, you can promote your whole business from it. Um, I wouldn't say I'm like a social media expert by any means. I kind of dip in and out of it. My, like, my work is consistent. Whenever I do a wedding, I'll generally take a picture and it'll go up on my Instagram. So that's yeah. always going. I dip in and out of like being really chatty on stories and like getting really into like, you know, chatting away on Instagram. And then the next week I'll be like, can't, bleh, can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm sort of like, I definitely aren't like um, any kind of like influencer type person. I just don't think I'd have the energy. Don't know how they do it. But it's brilliant for, it's brilliant for what you need it for. And you can dip in and out of it. And mine is definitely growing, um, which is great. I love seeing new people coming on, but I'm in no urge to have like a huge following or anything. I, I love just having it there and I can use it and it's a great business tool and I really enjoy it sometimes and then I don't other times. But I do think yeah. it's brilliant. And yeah, I think it's really important for, for businesses now to have a presence there. Because like anyone from yeah. all over the world can just jump on and have a look. Like it's brilliant. Yeah, so you probably couldn't, um, you couldn't really function as a freelancer without it. I, I don't think so. I think it would, I think it's, especially if you're a freelancer, it's, you do need to have a social media presence for anyone to know who you are and to even yeah. find you. Just to find you, even, yeah. yeah. And then just, um, you know, uh, I think we probably didn't mention at the start that you've worked on uh, various campaigns and then also, as we were saying before, um, we, we went live and you worked in television. You were the, were you the hair, the hair stylist for Dancing with the Stars? Well, there's two hairstylists. Yeah, so I was the hairstylist for the judges and the presenters. And then there's another ah. hairstylist for all the dancing people. So yeah, I was one of the hairstylists. Okay. 
and for anybody who's you know because you know again you know when you start off like looking to get a career in hairdressing there's so many different directions that you can go in yeah and to get to that point where you know you're a freelancer and um, then you you worked on you know fashion shoots campaigns and then to go into working on a television show and um, how you know how do people go about doing that is it sort of again word of mouth stroke of good luck um yeah like, recommended as a job again sort of similar to the instagram i'm probably the worst person to give this i'm sure there's hairdressers out there who are like i know exactly how you should do that whereas i'm like <laughs> no just like one day someone asked me would i do this so I always wanted to do, like I was always a stylist and it was always um, styling rather than coloring or whatever. So that was, yeah. I was always that. So when I was in Tony and Guy, I assisted an, an amazing hairstylist called Zara Cox, who did a lot of the campaign shoots and stuff um, for all the, you know, the shoots and shows and stuff like that. And she brought me with her as an assistant. So that experience I got with her was invaluable, like because I... I, I wasn't under pressure to be the person doing the stuff, but I got to see how it worked. I got to behind the scenes. I knew what the kit she brought. I, I got to see how she did it. Like I got to see how everything worked without any of it being on my shoulders, which is amazing. So I did a lot of stuff yeah. with her, which was absolutely brilliant. And then from then on, I started to do little bits of that, but I didn't actually love it as much as I thought I would love it. Like I thought that, that the salon would be secondary to that and I would actually end up going into that because I was like, I'm going to love that. But I didn't really, I didn't, it, it's really very long days. Like they're not as exciting as they seem. And I actually mm. loved being with my clients in the salon. And I was like, oh no, I actually don't think I love that. So I, anyway, I was in the salon for another few years. And then when I came out of the salon to be freelance, I was like, oh, that kind of work was good. Like I dabbled in that, but I think I'll stick to bridal because I like people and it's in the diary and nothing changes. And then as I did the bridal, someone said, any chance you're free for this? And I was like, oh, well, okay, yeah, sure. And then I just went and did that. And then someone said, this person wants you to do their hair. Do you want to do it? And I was like, oh, okay, yeah. So like, I definitely didn't say to myself, I'm going to be freelance. I want to work in TV with the Dancing with the Stars crew. Like, no, it just, these little opportunities arose. And I was like, well, I'm not in the salon. So I'm actually off work on Monday or like yeah. usually in the salon, there'd be a shoot and I'd be like, oh, I have 12 clients booked in. I can't do that. Whereas I was yeah. like, well, I have, I have nothing. I have no wedding on Thursday. Like I'll do it. So these little opportunities came in the last few years only really. And I've just embraced them as they've come. I don't, I don't really go looking for them to be honest, but if they come my way, I'll, do whatever I need to do them and I've really yeah. enjoyed I have really enjoyed it because and people love that like people love when you've done someone famous's hair like it's one of those talking points that people are like what are they like and you're like <laughs> their hair like and yeah. actually working on on Dancing with the Stars then um you, as we were kind of chatting about it beforehand like that went live every Sunday night yeah or Sunday evening I think it was at half six wasn't it yeah like in terms of you know work your work you know commitments to that would yeah. you like you know I presume you just didn't rock up at six o'clock <laughs> and do someone's hair no. like was there like, planning in advance yeah so that one's a big commitment so it's on every Sunday obviously for three months so it's on a good time of year because you don't have a lot of weddings in January February March anyway so for me yeah. I was like oh this couldn't be better times like January February March I'm like tumbleweeding yeah so it was good but I am um, I just had to remember not to put work in on Sundays, which I generally don't. But then I had to commit to all day every Sunday. So okay. the show's on half six, but I started at half nine. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So year one, I had three ladies and three men, and I started at half nine in the morning. And then last year, I had one less lady because the after show wasn't on last year. So I had one less person. So I used to start about 11. Um, and then wow. you'd finish, obviously, after the show about nine so it was a very long day but it was okay. totally worth it it was brilliant yeah now I knew I mean I, I knew you weren't like strolling in at six o'clock to do the hair but I wouldn't yeah. have thought that you had to be in that early in, in yeah. advance and like would you say like on a you know you'd finish up on the Sunday night um would you have decided already for the following week I suppose you did you have to go very much on what they were wearing or how did that work? yeah it was, it was all about what they were wearing. So there's a stylist there and she would pick all the outfits. And usually, no, I'd kind of, we had a little uh, WhatsApp group. So you'd get a text 
maybe Thursday or Friday about what they might be wearing. Um, but usually on Saturday, they'd all be in all day Saturday. They do all the fittings. They decide what everybody's yeah. wearing. And then it would be like, I'm definitely wearing this tomorrow. And then you'd be like, oh, what do you think of for the hair? But it depends on the person. Like uh, some of the people will know exactly the way they want their own hair. And yeah. other people are like, I don't know, what do you think? Like that day, because they're like, yeah. oh, so laid back. So it kind of depends on whose hair you're doing. But um, there's a little bit of planning, but I always have a Pinterest board for those people. Yeah. Um, all year. And I every time I see a picture, I'm like, oh, that'd be lovely on Jen. And I put pop it yeah. in my Pinterest board. So I kind of have a whole grid of pictures. And Okay. Yeah. So, and again, I suppose it allowed you to be um, creative as well. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it depends on who you're working on. But on Dancing with the Stars, like one of my, so Lorraine Barry is like hugely creative with her hair. She loves to be like different every week. She wants yeah. to look. Um, whereas Jennifer Zamparelli likes her, you know, would, would be a little bit more, not samey, like we do do different things every week, but she wouldn't go for like a, a 50s look necessarily and then go yeah. for a 50s look. Whereas, um, yeah, Lorraine would, could very much decide on anything and everything. Yeah. Which is brilliant. Yeah. That's the yeah. element in that, like absolutely love it. And then you had to do the men as well, yeah? Yeah, so um, I don't really have to do a lot because they do their own hair. Um, like Nikki Byrne just comes in that perfect um, so I didn't really do anything um, but Julian likes a bit of glitter so there'd be I a bit of going to say, yeah were you spraying all the glitter on yeah Julian? a bit of glitter spray yeah yeah it was good good fun yeah and um, so you also run your own is, is it specifically it's an upstyle academy yeah I call it upstyle academy it's a lot long hair like so there's it's not like every single style I do is an upstyle but it's you know bridal hair and event hair so it could be down style but it'll be styled hair and um, so no cutting or coloring or anything like that just styling. Okay and how does that work then do like do, is it online now because of the yeah, like or... it's the sort of thing that again I, I kind of roll it out in January when I'm quiet and I do a couple of classes and then I don't do anything for the rest of the year like um it never I never made it into anything majorly continuous it was sort of every January I'm like oh, I think I'll do my classes again so that's what I had been doing and then during the lockdown I was like I need to do something so I started to record all my tutorials and then I put them up online. So um, you buy a ticket and then you get access to the online training. Okay. Platform. So that's up there and people just can dip in and out. And then I do a live every month and, you know, people interact. So yeah, I actually love the online version. I think I prefer it. And did you feel actually during lockdown, um, because like, as I said, you're obviously quite creative and, you know, you like sort of making, creating stuff. Did you yeah. feel a bit, yeah. um, sort of like lost without having a head in front of you to create or did you just work away on your, yeah, your like head? It's funny. It, it took me a while to unwind like I didn't think I was wound up really but it took me a while to sort of stop doing like because I'm always doing and I have kids so like if I'm not working I'm with them and I'm always rushing from one to the other mm. and it took me a while to sort of stop and um, so I was sort of like working on my dolly head all the time. And then I was cutting my husband's hair on Instagram, showing people how to cut men's hair. And then I'd be cutting my fringe on Instagram. And then I was cutting my daughter's hair. And then I was like, would you just stop? Like, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> so then there was a, a while where I just did nothing and just tried to really like, we were meant to be on holidays in Greece. So I was like, let's just lie in the garden and pretend. Yeah. Pretend we're then I sort of, yeah. Then I just did nothing. And I actually loved that. I was like, yeah, like take this time. You're not going to have it again. So then I did nothing. And that, that was also lovely. And yeah. then I decided I was going to get up my, get my tutorials online. So then I started to record them and then had to edit them. Um, I had to teach myself how to edit videos. So that took up loads of time. So yeah, I, I will always like busy myself with something. Even if I don't want to, I'll always be like, I'll, something I'll start in my brain and then I'll start to, oh, I have to do it. So I kind of annoy myself sometimes, but I did take <laughs> some time in the middle where, yeah. I but yeah, I do like to be doing things. Okay. And so finally, um, I suppose, you know, what's the best thing about being freelance and running your own business and for anybody, you know, do you have any entrepreneurial tips? Because you are an entrepreneur. <laughs> that, like that makes me feel so weird because I really don't think I am an entrepreneur. Someone said that to me the other day. You're an entrepreneur. I was like, oh, am I? Like what? And um, I suppose I am. 
I, I don't know, like just be, go with your, be yourself. Like don't try and be somebody else you see doing what you do. Like you just have to go with your gut and be yourself and do your own thing. And 100% you take, you take inspiration from other people. Like that's what hairdressers like and, and make works. Like that's what you do. You look at other people's work and you're like, oh, brilliant. And you can learn from other people. But just 100% like be yourself, decide what you're good at and just go for it and try not to look left and right too much. Like with, with social media and everything like that, you're surrounded by other people who seem to be succeeding and brilliant. And just don't get bogged down by it. Just do your own thing and um, hire an accountant. Yeah, so that the, on, the business, on the business end of it, I suppose you said that, that you're like, you're not very good at that kind of that's stuff. That's so. not my thing. And I think a lot of creative people, that's not where their talents lie. Um, and just definitely give that to somebody else to do. And then life is so much easier because then you can just yeah. do good stuff. Yeah, and also when you have to do that sort of stuff yourself, it takes you away from, you know, what yeah. you're really, why, why you became, you know, a freelance yeah. stylist in the first place. When, yeah. You know, you can't and do I your own work. I never did a business course. I never did anything like that. So yeah, I have all these ideas, but I don't really know the logistics of how it would work. And like, you have to get your taxes right and all those things or you're going to get in trouble. So yeah, yeah. I, I, know, I know a few people, freelancers who do that all themselves. So if you're that type of person, like go for it. Like they enjoy doing it and it works out for them. But for me, that, yeah. that, would, that would, I wouldn't have been able to do it. That would have tipped me over the edge. So I just delegated. Yeah, good idea yeah um okay well thank you so much for talking to us um i really enjoyed that i love the way you're um you know like you focused on as you said there yourself like you know to say to people you know go after what you want and it's like you do stuff that you you know you're good at yeah and like for instance like the color you don't bother with coloring because you don't no. think you're very good at it but like you're good at the creating and the styling so that's, that's a lovely part of your business that you're yeah. you're so focused on your own talents yeah but that's it when you're a freelancer like it's totally up to you what you do I mean it has to make sense business-wise there's no point doing something that nobody wants or needs but you can you can decide you can decide I only want to work three days a week and that's yeah. up to you you don't have to do what what other people are doing or what someone else tells you it's completely up to you you can do whatever you want and you can work the hours or whatever. in saying that now sometimes you end up working triple the hours because yeah you work for yourself but that's up to you as well like you can't you can't not do that and so yeah it is good just to focus on what you're good at i only like doing things that i'm good at really <laughs> it's a bit like us all really okay listen thank you so much for joining us and uh we wish you obviously every good wishes going forward with the brides to be as they all sort of come back out of the woodwork and um yeah and lovely to meet you on the screen and uh we'll talk to you again soon and Great. thank you everybody for tuning in and um if you just keep an eye on our social media for our webinar details for next week and we will see you all then so until next week bye bye thank you bye thank you Lillian. bye